Hey everyone, Sontat here, and welcome to what I think is going to be my final long sword builds video for Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. If you've been here before, welcome back. If you're new here, hi. Um, I'm Sontide, I make builds for Monster Hunter, and I'm also a huge nerd. So rather than basically pick skills and put them in a computer program like a set builder or a spreadsheet like people usually do, I thought I would make my own Python script to do it for me. So I made a Python script that goes through every piece of armor, every piece of charms, decorations, weapons, augments, curious crafting, all of it. Uh, the Python script goes through every combination of skills and everything else and calculates the best builds for it whatever conditions it's held to. So I tell it, hey, give me the best fire builds, or hey, give me the best poison builds. Get all those builds, I put them in a spreadsheet which has information on every single monster, their elemental weaknesses, their status weaknesses, everything. And then from that, I can find out what the best weapon builds are for the longsword for every single situation. And then I present it to you. Um, it's a bit extra, but I thought it was pretty fun and cool, and I hope you find it useful. So yeah. Let's get into it. In this new bonus update, they're calling it, they added a few new smaller things, not too much compared to Top to 5. Basically, they now have Primordial Malzina, which has new armor weapons. There is now a new form of Curious Crafting, which makes it easier to get charm slots. They've added some new skills and decorations, and they've made Frenzied Bloodlust more accessible. Now, for the long sword, most of these things don't actually matter. Uh, we're going to get through that bit by bit. But rather than go through everything in detail, like I usually do whenever there's a new patch, I thought I'd just remind us, since this is the final video, about the general longsword-like build principles and how and what we put on the longsword and why. So longsword builds have been a pretty interesting place since around Tile Update 4, I think, because longsword can fit basically every skill it wants. At least every skill I can get by decorations. So that's things like Quick Sheath, which makes our attacks faster, things like Weakness Exploit or Critical Boost, which boosts our damage. The Longsword can quite easily fit all of them. What makes the builds different between like the good builds and the amazing builds of it are what I call the unique skills. So these skills are skills you can only get from specific armor pieces or from Curious Crafting. So these are skills like Wind Mantle, which you can only get from Risen Kushal Deora. Powder Mantle from Risen Teostra, Frostcraft from Vulcana, Mail of Hellfire from Scorned Magna Malo, Frenzied Bloodlust from Risen Shigaru Megala, and Built Up Boost from Risen Camellios. Now, all of these skills are really, really good. But because we can only get them from specific armor pieces or a curious crafting, we can't fit all of them. But we want to fit as much as we really can. Now, because we only have like five armor pieces and each one can get a curious crafting, we can really reliably only get like 10 of them. And there's a lot more than 10 skill points in this. So basically what this means is if we ever want to use any piece that doesn't have any of these skills, you know, it needs to be really, really, really good. Uh, every point of Mail of Hellfire is a massive boost to your damage. Uh, every point of Powder Mantle is a massive boost to your damage. So if you lose one of these points, it really, really better be worth it. Now, because of that, a lot of the new armor pieces aren't going to be too useful. One of them is pretty good, but for the most part, because they don't have any good or uh, unique skills, I call them, uh, they're not very, very good. Uh, they have Blood Awakening, this new skill, uh, which basically boosts damage after you heal up, but it's a bit unreliable, and it's not as good as, for example, Mail of Hellfire, so it's not going to make a huge difference. Uh, in the same way, Slot Plus, which you can get from Curious Crafting now, uh, basically it's a new Curious Crafting mode that makes it easier to get more slots. It's not going to be very useful because we can, again, fit all of the important skills. We're just missing these unique skills which you can't get from decorations. So because of that, we aren't really going to use slot plus. Uh, so yeah, those are our basic long sword build principles. We're going to get all of our core skills from decorations, and we're going to make sure we can fit as many of these unique skills as we possibly can. And yeah, so other notes just before I start. Basically, we want to get the decorations going to recommend from the builds from Curious Melting Cyclists. Uh, these are the ones that let us pick the skills that we want if we use curious crafted um, decorations in them. Um, I'm going to recommend some particular curious crafting augments. Feel free to arrange them um, however you wish. This is basically what I decided what I found would be the best to do as little curious crafting as possible, but all of these should be relatively easy to get. Uh, and you get them from normal Curious Crafting. So you don't do Stability, you don't do Stills Plus, you don't do Slots Plus, you just do the normal Curious Crafting, and you'll get them eventually. Um, you'll run out of money before you run out of um, Essence, uh, at least I did, 
and by the time you actually get far enough in the game to fully max out your weapons, you'll definitely fully max out all of your armor pieces. It's actually surprisingly easy to get good skills from Curious Crafting. And yeah, um, all these sets work for all variations of switch skills. This is pretty switch skill agnostic. Uh, if you do want my general recommendation, basically what I do is I use... Um, yeah. So on red I have Drawn Double Slash, Spirit Reckoning, Special Sheaf, Soaring Kick, and Harvest Moon. And on blue, I swap Special Sheaf and Soaring Kick for Sacred Sheaf and Silk Mind Sakura Slash. But honestly, whatever you use, it's going to be fine. Um, this isn't going to really change your builds so much nowadays. Again, just because we can fit all the skills you really want. So yeah, uh, now let's finally get towards the builds. So in this final builds video, I'm basically going to go through three types of builds. One, uh, the sort of elemental counter builds that are going to be really good against specific monsters and specific matchups. They're going to go through the best general use builds. There's going to be three of them now. And then we're just going to close off towards the very end about situational builds that aren't really, really that good, but are worth thinking about and building if you really, really want to. So yeah, uh, before we do that though, very quick honorable mentions, builds that well, weapons that aren't going to get built here, which I'm a bit sad about. Uh, so first up, we aren't going to talk about Wyvern Blade Luna, uh, which for the longest time was the best poison weapon and basically the best longsword weapon uh, in the game. It just got outclassed at the very end, uh, which is quite unfortunate. It was so good and just tripped over before it got to the finish line by another poison longsword. Uh, in a very similar way, uh, Red Flash and Street Scythe are both dragon longswords that were like in a fight for first and second. They were just like swapping place every patch. There was like a tiny bit of fear when Chaotic Gormagala released the Chaos Loa longsword, but these guys stayed on top and then once again tripped just before the finish line and there is a slightly better dragon longsword now. Uh, one more honorary mention, the Spirit Binder, which is the best paralysis longsword. It's also the only paralysis longsword, so it's really, really bad. Um, and finally, it's not here, but Oppressor's Abyss was a Thunder longsword that is no longer in the game. Or something. It got renamed. Uh, I still find that funny. <laughs> it got renamed without them telling us it was a stealth update. So, yeah. Anyway, so let's start off by talking about, uh, ignore that, about the elemental weapons. So these weapons are weapons that trade raw for element which let them do some massive damage against the very specific ones of this. Uh, but overall, on average, low damage. So basically this means you don't really want to build just one of these, you want to build this and a better general use longsword. Uh, but they are going to be really good against the very specific matchups. So I think the best uh, example I can have of that at first is going to be the water longsword, the Abyss Springer Blade. So in this video, I'm going to be showing basically what I'm going to call the average damage numbers. Um, this is basically a number that's uh, related to the overall raw damage and the elemental damage that will be received by all of the monsters on average using their actual hit zone values. Um, so yeah, you can see the water build on screen right now. And you can see that it has all of the very important and useful stores that we want. It has Frostcraft 3. Uh, for massive draw damage, it has Wind Mantle 3. It has a point of Powder Mantle. Powder Mantle is one of the best damaging skills in the game. I have a whole video on that. Um, and it manages to get Mail of Hellfire 2. Uh, this is pretty interesting. Not many other builds are going to fit Mail of Hellfire 2. This build can just actually do that. So Mail of Hellfire gives you a big boost to raw uh, in red and element in blue at the cost of your defenses. Uh, if you don't like that, feel free to drop one point for something else, maybe something like Element Exploit or a Comfort Skill. Uh, I wouldn't recommend dropping both. The first point of Mail of Hellfire, the first point of Mail of Hellfire does do a very significant damage boost. So maybe just leave at least one skill if you can. Uh, but yeah, so the reason why you want to build this is because it deals absolutely massive water damage against the water weak enemies. Uh, so a few really strong enemies are very water weak, which is why this is so useful. So it includes things like Flaming Espinas, who's really hard, uh, as well as Silver Rathalos and Risen, Risen Teostra. All of these are like really, really strong monsters, so having a good water weapon is going to be really useful against these guys. And yeah, you can see that compared to like the average damage it does, which is 865, it does about like 50% more damage against the enemies that is weak to water. So yeah, use this against water weak monsters. Uh, the second big elemental counter weapon is the ice 
longsword, the Flicker Bizzard Slash. This one has a bit higher average damage and is good against the different monsters. Really similar though, really similar build. Uh, it doesn't have the second part of Mail of Hellfire, but has a lot of similar things. Uh, and managed to get some free one slots. Um, so this is good against a different set of monsters. So Rajang and Fierce Rajang, great against them. Uh, great against receiving Basil Gears and great against Diablos. Uh, so yeah, um, great against Icebook enemies, but really nothing else. Now, in general, for these builds, you're going to see a few of them are going to have what I call free one slots. You can slot in whatever you want. Um, if nothing else, I would recommend putting in maybe a second point of Intrepid Heart, because Intrepid Heart is such a great defensive skill, especially for the Longsword. Um, if you use Silkmind Sakura Slash, it's good because it charges really, really quickly, and when it's charged, you don't get knocked back, which means you can do more damage and do something like a Sacred Sheaf without getting interrupted. If you're using Soaring Kick, this means you won't get roared out of a Soaring Kick, which is always so annoying when it happens. So yeah, um, otherwise out of that you can fit in whatever else you want. Spirit Bird's Call is one of my favorites, but really it's up to you. Um, now the last elemental longsword I'm going to talk about is going to be the Oppressor's Law. The Zenogre longsword, which is a Thunder longsword. Um, this is pretty interesting because it is actually a nice hybrid weapon between raw and element. Um, it's actually pretty good at both. The problem is there aren't very many thunder weak monsters in the game. So you can see that's good against Gold Wrathy and Tigrex, but it's not that much better than other weapons. Uh, it's really good against Shogun Sienator, but Shogun Sienator is a really easy monster. So unlike you know the water and ice longswords which were good against really really hard enemies like Flaming Espinas or Risen Teostra or Frears Rajang, uh, this one isn't going to be so good against really, really strong ones, even if it's on average a really, really high weapon. You can see average damage of 985. That's like massive compared to the previous ones, which were like in the 800s. This is at almost 1000. But yeah, so that is Oppressor's Law. So those have been the elemental longswords. Now let's talk about the best longswords, the ones that are going to be useful in the most situations. Now these ones are really, really good. For the most part because they have really high raw and in addition to their high raw they have something else that pushes them over the edge uh, beyond every other longsword in the game uh, because of that they end up good in all matchups but end up being really really good in very specific matchups as such you know if you just build one of these it's going to be fine but ultimately you do want to build as many of these as you can just so you can use them all in their very specific situations and yeah, we're going to go through them one by one. We're going to go them in increasing order. So we're going to go with the third best one to the second best one to the best one. And to my understanding, the third best longsword in the game of Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak is the new Silver Severer, the new longsword we get from Primordial Malzina. Now, if you've seen this weapon before you saw this video, that might actually be a bit surprising to you. You might think it should be higher. Uh, and I mean, just look at these stats. So this weapon, uh, how do I see the weapon itself? So this weapon has three four slots. So you can get six seals just from the weapon. You know, it has a natural purple, it has great dragon element, it has decent raw, but there are a few like really subtle problems with the weapon. One, because it's an elemental weapon, you don't get great augments. So raw and status weapons get really, really good uh, curious craft augments on the weapon itself. It gets much higher raw bonus than elemental weapons. In addition to that, even though it gets all of these slots, we sort of hit an awkward point in our builds where, once again, we already fit all of the skills we really want, um, especially with four slot decorations. I mean, okay, so I have the build equipped right now, mostly. I haven't curious crafted my last piece because I ran out of money. Um, but, you know, so if you look at this, I have, like, attack 4, attack 4, critical element 4, you know, great skills. Uh, expert 4, great skill. But then I just start running out. Um, you know, I have element exploit 4 in this slot because I had nothing else to put in the extra slot, basically. Um, elemental, the second part of element exploit doesn't really do much more than the first point. You know, you, it's... Uh, one point wonder skill. You want to put one point in that and then use the other point for something else. But because you have so many four slots with this weapon, you're forced to use something a bit weaker like the second point of element exploit. You know, same deal. I have a hard dragon four decoration, which is pretty inefficient. Um, it only gives four points, so you need an extra point somewhere else. You need to use like one point of dragon. 
uh, in another slot. For a lot of the other weapons, for all of the other builds, using a two slot and a three slot to get five points, having to rely on a four slot is quite inefficient. Basically, uh, we sort of get too many slots on this weapon and that we do really, really end up hitting the sort of maximum of the skills we want. But yeah, despite that, it is overall quite a good weapon, especially against you know the hardest monsters in the game. Um, overall, the average damage you can see isn't that high. It's lower than what we saw for the Thunder Longsword. But the difference is that compared to the Thunder Longsword, the enemies that are weak to Dragon are the really, really hard ones. You know, they're monsters like Malzina, Amatsu, Risen Shigara Megala. Whereas the monsters that are weak to Dragon, sorry, the monsters that are, are immune to Dragon are the monsters that are really, really easy. You know, things like Acnesom or Arzurus, who you aren't going to have any trouble with. But yeah, because of that, you know, this weapon is just going to be so good. So in the comments of my previous videos, people have asked me to show damage numbers from my builds. So I thought I'd do that quickly here against this anniversary. Um, so let's do that now. The Ice Bird Slash into Helmbreaker. You can see that's almost 5,000 damage, uh, which is a lot. So yeah, these builds definitely do high damage, and I definitely recommend building these. And yeah, this is just for the third best longsword. What are the top two? Well, if you've seen the series before, uh, I think you probably know the top two. Uh, number two is the Cactus Himmel, the Flaming Espinas longsword, which is really weird and interesting because it is both an elemental longsword and also a status longsword. It has both element and status, which is a great combination. Because of that, it has really, really high average damage for an elemental weapon. Uh, just because it's poison is so good, and it's good against a lot of these really, really strong fire weak monsters. Things like Vilcana, Risen Camellios, and also Linagaran, who is annoying for me. And yeah, that unique combination of fire and poison wrecks these fire weak enemies. And because it's a poison weapon, it can use this great skill called Build Up Boost, which boosts damage for status when you inflict status on enemies. Uh, whenever your weapon puts status damage, which is going to be every third hit with this weapon. So yes, uh, the Cactus ML is going to be doing massive damage, uh, both in terms of raw, in terms of poison, and in terms of status. The sort of triple threat is what makes it so, so good. And finally, at long last, the King of Long Swords is going to be Magrez's Asterism. The Poison Longsword, with its average damage of 1,011. Remember, everything else was in the 800 to 900, so this one goes well over 1,000. It's overall the best weapon. It doesn't have the high highs nor the low lows of the previous weapons. Remember, all the weapons were hitting 1,200, 1,300 against specific matchups. This one is going to hit around 1,000 for basically everything. Um, including, again, some of the hardest monsters in the game. Things like Risen, Crimson, Kulho Valstrax, Kushal Deora, Scorn Magnamalo. It's going to hit every monster equally, and on average, it will be your best bet. But other weapons do have their unique uses. So this is going to be the main weapon I'm going to recommend, and the overall best longsword, but every other longsword still has its unique uses. So yeah. Uh, those were the best ones. Let's quickly go through a few situational ones. Um, in terms of pure fire, Volcanic Apocalypse is really quite good. It's basically the fire version of the uh, Abyss Bringer Blade or the Flicker Blizzard Slash. Those are really, really high elemental weapons. So Volcanic Apocalypse is a really, really high fire elemental weapon with really low raw. Um, it does do more damage against Risen Camellios than the Cactus Female, ever so slightly. Um, it's not really worth building for that. What it could be useful for is if you're playing multiplayer, uh, because if there's too many players and everyone has poison, um, if everyone has poison, poison gets a bit worse. If you're the only one with poison, poison is great, poison is even better, but if everyone has poison, poison gets worse. So if you have you know two buddies who are playing Cactus ML, the other two can play Volcanic Apocalypse if you really want to kill a fire weak monster. Uh, in a similar way, Blast Longsword is good in the same situations. Uh, the best Blast Longsword is the Basil of Prozio Rook Zero. In fact, it is slightly better against Crimson, Go Crimson Glow Valstraps than Magrosa's Asterism. Again, about 1%, not really a huge difference. Um, but again, especially in multiplayer, if everyone's using poison, having some of the Blast is going to be a big difference in your damage. And finally, uh, the Antique Machina LS uh, is a Sleep Longsword. 
and this guy is actually surprisingly good. It has great average damage of 945, so only about 5% less damage than the uh, Poison Longsword, but it also has Sleep, which is great. For single player, Poison is going to be better, um, but one, you might find waking up an enemy from Sleep is more fun. If you do, more power to you, go for it in this build. Uh, also, if you're playing in multiplayer, having someone with sleep to sleep monster so everyone else can get ready for massive attacks, you know, that's going to be great too. So maybe use this weapon in multiplayer if you want. But yeah, in single player, not too good, but they definitely, definitely have their own unique situations if you want to use them. So yeah, in summary and conclusions, there are six longsword builds that are worth using and three more situational that could quite be useful uh, in Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak for the longsword. Uh, surprisingly enough, this is an amazing balance between raw, element, and status. All of them have their own uses, which I think is amazing, uh, especially compared to World, for example. So yeah, and finally, do feel free to vary these to your preference. So for example, especially in the Megros' Asterism build, I use Poison Attack because once again, we have all of the steals we really want. Feel free to change that for something else. Um, if you want to use a defensive skill, go for it. You have enough damage already. Uh, you can put in something else. Um, and yeah, overall, that is basically it from me. Uh, on screen right now, you can see a full matchup chart, all of the monsters that each weapon is going to be used. But otherwise, yeah, uh, thank you all so much for watching. If you've been here from the beginning, I really appreciate you. Uh, hopefully you've liked and subscribed. Uh, but even if you haven't, you know, thanks so much uh i love all of your comments and all of your responses uh it's really kept me going it's really like pushed me to you know want to make these i uh, want to do these well and yeah hopefully you stick around i should be around uh i might make a few long story videos every now and then i'll probably shift to a different game or do different types of videos but i will be back for the next monster hunter game and yeah hope to see you all then thank you Bye.